Car Classroom. My name is Kathy Pantelis. And I'm Mark Switzer. And we together are the artistic directors for the Hillsborough Community College Guitar Series. This week, the Virtual Guitar Classroom is on the road as we head to the guitar studio of Scott Sanchez in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Enjoy. Hello, my name is Scott Sanchez. It's great to be with you here in this virtual space. I want to start by saying thank you to Kathy Pantelis and Mark Switzer for including me in this uh, guitar series, this virtual guitar series at Hillsborough Community College in Tampa, Florida. Uh, wonderful uh, international guitar series that includes guitars from all over the world. Uh, so it's a real honor to be here. It was in uh, February 2021 this year that uh, the, the guitar uh, community, the guitar world, classical guitar world, lost one of its bright luminaries uh, when Jorge Morel passed away. Jorge Morel uh, was well known as a performer and uh, is well known as a composer and an arranger for the classical guitar, contributing many pieces. Um, uh, he's known was known as a teacher, and in my experience. Uh, he was just a generous uh, human being, a, a, a true uh, dedicated artist that I was fortunate fortunate enough to uh, get to know a little bit over the years. And it was um, back when I made my first uh, recording, Preludio, I recorded Jorge's arrangements of Bernstein's West Side Story Suite. And it was through that recording that I uh, was eventually able to um, to meet Jorge Morel and he reached he uh, called me and invited me to his home and I would uh, meet with him in New York City. It was so nice. I didn't even have to bring a guitar. He was so generous. He'd bring out all these different, you know, he had a few different instruments that were so nice and he let me play his instruments. He had this uh, one particular instrument I remember was this uh, guitar that had belonged to Chet Atkins that he would bring out to me as a Velasquez and uh, just a, a beautiful sounding instrument. And so I would play for Jorge, and uh, uh, he would share insights about his music, and he, he'd play for me, and um, it was just a really uh, 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 important part of my, um, my experience as a, as a musician starting out, and um, I'm, I'm glad I had that experience. I would get together with Jorge when I, when I could, you know, in New York City. And um, he's, he's since, he uh, moved, down, moved about it. Uh, close to a decade ago, he moved to Orlando, Florida. So I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing uh, some tips on ways to play Jorge's music that he shared with me uh, on this particular piece of music on his probably his most famous piece, Donza Brazil Era. And um, I want to share some tips maybe on how to play it if you're studying the piece or thinking of studying the piece. And also to give you a little background on on Jorge's life throughout and um, just just generally some tips on how I, I like to approach this piece. So why don't we start with um, get started and I'll um, play the piece for you and then and then we'll jump into the, the um, to the lesson part of the the, the uh, uh, presentation. Thank you. 
That was Danza Brasileira by Jorge Morel. Jorge Morel was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He picked up the guitar around age 11. His father was an actor and a musician, and he was Jorge's first guitar teacher. Jorge took to the guitar very seriously, uh, eventually moved to Puerto Rico, was performing there professionally when Vladimir Bobri, the president of the New York City Classical Guitar Society, heard Jorge performing and invited him to New York City to perform. And eventually Jorge settled in New York, gave his Carnegie Hall debut in 1961 to great acclaim, uh, playing repertoire that I think was probably a little unusual at the time in the guitar world. Um, now it's pretty standard repertoire, but pieces by Crespo and Lauro and um, different South American composers. And uh, it was through this experience, through the acclaim that he received from his, his debut, that he came to the notice of uh, the owner of the uh, Village Gate, a famous jazz club in New York City, and was asked to perform a nightly set there. He would perform two or three sets a night of about a half hour in length. And he would play uh, classical guitar repertoire by standard repertoire composers such as Soar and Tarina and uh, Taroba. And he would also incorporate uh, his own arrangements eventually and his own compositions that were very influenced by the by the jazz of the time. And um, especially this piece, Danza Brasileira, was influenced by the uh, popular bossa nova and the samba of the day. And as we get into this, I would like to talk a little bit just briefly about the publication of this piece, the score I'm working from, and, and talk about the form of the piece. This is my copy of Danza Brasileira. This was published by Ashley Mark in 1981 in the United Kingdom, and it's part of volume one of Jorge's music. There's a whole series published by Ashley Mark of Jorge's music, and this particular volume has a few other pieces by Jorge and uh, for solo guitar. The other volumes of which there are at least at least a dozen, I think. Uh, there are duets, uh, solos, and other um, more compositions by Jorge and arrangements by Jorge. I do know that Mel Bay Publications has quite a significant catalog of his music these days, uh, but I don't think this one is published there. I'm not positive. Um, I'm sure you can find a copy of of the um, piece somewhere if you don't have this as part of your library and you're interested in, in um, uh, locating the music. When I learn a piece of music, one of the things I like to do is uh, figure out what the form of the music is. Uh, I'll just read through the, the um, music, sight read through it many times. Uh, I'm not worried about technical errors at this point. I mean, I do worry about those deeper things later, worry about a deeper analysis later. But initially, I'm just reading through it many times, listening and trying to figure out what the, the piece is about and uh, figuring out what the form is, basically what the different sections are in the, in the music is one of my, my main goals. It reminds me of what I've heard actors speak of, which is uh, exploring the turf. When they get a new part, they might just read through the lines, read, walk around the stage with the part, reading out loud without a lot of inflection, um, not reading with much character or spirit, but by reading it many times, getting an idea of where the high points are, where the tension is and where the release is. And it's much like I think of how uh, we approach music when we learn uh, a piece of music. And in, in other words, we, we work on the form. So let me um, uh, dive in a little bit and just give you my ideas and what I think the form of this piece is. Pretty straightforward. Uh, basically an A, B, A section. You have an A section, a B section, and an A section. Uh, with what I think of as a, kind of, I think of it having a little intro at the beginning, a little inter interlude in the middle, and a little outro or coda uh, at, uh, at the end. Uh, so, so I'd say, you know, the beginning you have this first four measures, you vamp on this A minor six chord. And um, that just kind of, that vamp sets up the rhythm of the whole piece. And then at, at Measure five, uh, you have the the um, the main theme, really kind of a kind of popish theme of the um, of the samba. There, uh, measures five until measures uh, fifty two. That's the A section. So it starts there and then goes clear up to to um, fifty two. I would you know it's say it start you know it starts to change. Here, this is the end of the, the A section. And 
and so on. And then the B section goes from measures 53 until measures 66. So that's the section where you have the... I think of this next section as a little interlude where you have the um it's some material that you had before you have this arpeggio and then you have this little kind of this little uh, run up the neck chromatically uh, and it's a little interlude to connect back to the a section <laughs> And so on. That's the basic interlude there. And then it picks back up at um, at the, the main theme again with the, um, the... That picks back up at uh, measure 80. And I'd say basically, for the most part, it goes unchanged until the end. But I kind of think of the... Uh, at measure 101, there's a little detour where we... Um, when we're doing this uh, little... Uh, let's see, we do the... Right here, there's that material came before, but it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a change. And then from that point forward, I kind of like to improvise with it a little bit um, uh, until the end of the of the music. So again, just a fast review. You have measures one through four, intro, measures five through fifty-two, uh, little uh, that's the A section, measures fifty-three through sixty-six, uh, the B section, uh, measures. Uh, 67 i'd say through through um through 80 so through 79 really that's a little uh interlude and then from 80 until 101 another recap of the a section and then from uh 101 to then kind of like a coda but based on some of the material that came before so that's the the general form i think of when i play this piece Jorge Morel's classical guitar compositions are very influenced by uh, jazz music, American jazz. Um, I kind of put him in the category of a George Gershwin uh, or um, maybe a Leonard Bernstein, who's who wrote classical music with a, a jazz uh, jazz tinge to it. And um, Jorge's music, he would play. Um, he would write in uh, extended chords. Uh, C9, C13s, and he would also use jazz harmonies, 2-5-1 progressions um, throughout different types of jazz harmonies. Um, the most common is 2-5-1. And uh, I just wanted to give you a couple examples of that and you can hear the hear the jazz harmony in that. So at the beginning you have the, the first chord he plays is an A minor. Uh, he could have just written it as a traditional A minor uh, chord, but he adds a 6 to it, uh, um, so it ends up being... Comes up A minor six, so right away we hear some chords that are you don't hear as much here. Have that kind of uh, unsettled uh, D seven harmony. But right here on the um, on the uh, seventh measure we have a, a two five one two five one progression in the key of C major. It's a D minor seven, a G seven, and a C major seventh. It's, uh, we have those harmonies throughout. We have a 2-5-1 in the key of uh, A minor in the piece often. That uh, B uh, half diminished A, uh, the E7 in the A minor. Uh, you hear hear these throughout. And um, even, you know, like he kind of, he ends on um, this uh, A minor 6 with a 9 at the end. Sounds kind of unsettled. Um, I actually add one more strum there. I saw Jorge do this in a performance. And I just liked how it kind of gives it more of a finale than the, the one. Uh, basically, it's a, a whole note written at the end of the score. It's written as two half notes tied together. Uh, and just a note before I forget, there is one mistake that, that's important to remember is that 64 is in the score. It's not an F natural. It's written as an F natural. That doesn't sound right. There's an F sharp that should have been written in the score, and, and the clue to that is the fingering tells you what what um, what the note probably should be because you do that with the fourth. So, uh, so again, the jazz harmony. Jorge was progressive throughout his life, uh, learning uh, about com composition from the books of Walter Piston 
and uh, told me he read the books of Walter Piston. I know he studied orchestration and uh, always was learning. And his pieces near, um, you, you know, as he matured, became more sophisticated, used more counterpoint. And he was he would um, add in these jazz, jazz harmonies. I think that's one of the reasons they have this this just nice sound and um, that that is worth, you know, it's worth looking into his music. I'd like to share some things with you that Jorge told me about this music, some tips about playing it. Uh, this is a definitely a samba rhythm. It's a highly syncopated uh, Brazilian rhythm. And uh, Jorge said he actually liked to hear the, the piece at a moderate to slower tempo than, than he often heard it. But um, having said that, I always heard him play it really fast. And I I've, um, often prefer to, to play it pretty fast too, I guess. Uh, one of the first things he pointed out is to get that really to accent that that uh, rhythm at the beginning, and these are these are some of the things that are kind of hard that musical notation you can't always easily represent through the notation itself. Uh, but one element that sticks out to me is right at the beginning with those four measures, that first four measures, the vamp at the beginning. Um, if you, if you, if I just play that as this music as written, it has it's just a if I let the notes sustain, it kind of would sound like this. Again, I'll do that. It's and at a faster tempo. That's literally what's written. But what Jorge told me about this is he he likes to play like this. He liked to play it like this. So the the difference is that I'm actually doing a staccato effect with my left hand. And this is common if you listen to uh, Brazilian music, uh, the guitar swath and do this kind of syncopated, uh, controlled, uh, not syncopated, but um, staccato effect with the left hand. So it's... So all I'm doing is I'm just lifting up after I play the chord. So it's a slow tempo. That's the staccato effect. Here it is more legato the way it's written. Here it is again staccato. So. Much different effect then. So that was one of the first things that Jorge pointed out to me. Another thing that he pointed out to me occurs um, where you can change uh, what's actually written on the page? It happens uh, on the um, really on the the eighth measure of the of the music. You have this first, now I actually changed what's written in the score. The, what's written in the score is you have um, at measures uh, at, at measures uh, seven. You have. See if you can hear the difference. Right on the C major chord, it's actually the change is on measure eight. In the score, it just stays on the same voicing, the, the strings four, three, and two. Sounds fine like that, but Jorge suggested that um, play to, he suggested to me to play it like this. And all I'm doing is on the and, the uh, the uh, second eighth note on measure eight, I go up to the strings in the C major seven voicing. I go up to strings uh, three, two, and one. So instead of staying on the inside, I I I, I move the voicing up. So it sounds like this. Just gives it a little more texture. You're just going back and forth between these two voicings, but instead of staying on that inside voice. And again, another kind of common thing, if you listen to Jobim or, or Bonfa, some of the uh, Brazilian composers, that is common in that music. So uh, you can change that voicing uh, to rather than sticking on the same the same voices. Some of the other things that Jorge pointed out to me, uh, well, one of the big things was that he told me it was okay 
which I thought this was really uh, interesting uh, um, when he told me this as the composer of this music. And he said this with a lot of his pieces that I would play for him. He said it was okay to improvise somewhat with the music. That um, you know, I got, I did definitely get the idea sometimes from Jorge that the the score was just was was a very good outline, but it wasn't necessarily um, gospel. It wasn't the way it had to be played exactly every time. So he encouraged me to improvise. Uh, one of the big sections that I changed is uh, at measure twenty five, and whenever this occurs, instead of playing the the written part, which is the... That's what's written in the score, measure 25. I like to do this thing where it just kind of, it makes it uh, a little more rhythmic to my thinking. And I add these groups of six, these sextuplets here, these. And it gives it a little character. All I'm really doing is just, I'm going A, P, I, M, A. And then on the A, I, I rake up with my arm. That's like a uh, heavy metal guitarist would probably call that a, a sweep, a string sweep. I'm basically doing a string, string sweep with my ring, uh, my ring finger here. Um, that's one of the main things. Those are the main things that I uh, that, that come out to me that I remember that Jorge told me about it. Uh, and then also... Um, he actually gave me a little thing to improvise near the end when the theme comes back and uh, I'm trying to remember it's actually written in my score here yes I measure 106 he um, suggested this as something I could add in to the score so the original score is <laughs> But he gave me a little improvisatory uh, lick to add into this section beginning at measure uh, 106. Um, so I'll play from the beginning at measure 104. It's Let me do that one more time. So it's. So just as this uh, uh, kind of. Uh, extended a little bit of the harmony there and um, just as a little bit of a variation of what came before and then uh, I just added this in through having heard Jorge play this uh, the little percussion effect uh, you have the at measures it begins at measures uh, uh, 110 the you have the uh, t uh, it's really a 251 progression it's a uh, half diminished a B half diminished E7 and then an A minor I just add that little percussion instead of what's written there it's that's what's written I just like to add that little percussion and again it's something I saw Jorge do a lot something similar to that and it's fun to add that in there Something like that. Um, so those are the main things uh, that stick out to me that I remember that Jorge uh, told me about this piece of music. Again, one of the big things is that he, you know, that he just encouraged me to, you know, to be true to the rhythm. The rhythm was really important, but to have some fun with maybe adding little, little filigree, little um, like little riffs in into the score. One of the troublesome spots in this piece, uh, technically, I think, has to do with uh, with the left hand, and it has to do with left hand extension so just a, a brief description of some of the physiological movements we have in the the left hand when we play guitar if we start with our fingers like this together and we imagine there's like a mid like a line going through the middle of our hand the midline of our hand when our fingers are together they're adducted they're together when they separate that's called ab Abduction. So together, adduction, abduction, separated. Uh, when we play guitar, we have to do this a lot. We have to open up our hand and close our hand. And um, technically, when we're in a position, like a position being if my first finger's on the third fret and I stretch to the fifth fret, that's third position. 
that you know that my hand fits pretty comfort comfortably maybe just a little bit uh if i'm down here on the lower frets because they're wider um i have to be a little bit um separate a little bit abducted um so up here it's adducted the, the fingers are more together because the, the frets are narrower so it's a constantly when you're playing guitar you have to figure out how to open up your hand and of course these things become intuitive intuitive as we play uh, the other movements we want to think about are our wrist flexion in the left hand when we move inwards towards our forehand forearm that's flexion we move out that's extension a lot in the guitar we're, we're flexing a lot of the time sometimes we have to do some kind of um, extension things too um, um, but the other thing too is to consider the angle of our arm in relation again our fingers should should we want to think of a framework where we can get into uh, difficult movements on the instrument so uh, one place a, a, an example of this that I find is a little difficult is you have this left hand extension you have the C minor 9 chord uh, um, in this piece and that's at measure 45 um, he, he actually Jorge what he does is he this is normally you'll hear this like uh, this chord the C minor 9 a little C minor 9 it's a little bit more uh, uh, idiomatic here played in a kind of normal bossa nova type way like you have that C minor 9 might add an 11th to it but he takes the D in the chord which is the ninth and puts it up here which creates this kind of strong dissonance there and it's hard to get that chord so you have to figure out that really you're in third position if I'm in a normal third position with a bar then I have to extend extension of the finger of the fingers here that's um third position but once I add the bar and then this I have to bend my wrist flex my wrist and then move my elbow in a little bit towards my body so just if I go through it slowly the motion from where I'm moving from uh, in that section I'm going from see how my elbows out and then I have to come in come in and flex to open up my hand to get to that chord so just a little tip on a uh, technical tip on how to play a difficult passage I'll play it one more time just to show you and watch if you especially watch my arm the bending of the wrist that's what's important So again, all this is attached. Our fingers are attached to our hand, attached to our wrist, to our elbow, and so on up. And the more you can get the whole body involved, like we're dancers, we're uh, musical dancers on the instrument. So it's important to learn how to uh, use our body effectively so that we can enjoy playing the music and hopefully express ourselves the best to listeners. One of the technical tips I have for playing this piece has to do with the right hand and how we approach playing repeated chords. Uh, I think of uh, when we have repeated chords on the guitar, I think of there being kind of two basic approaches. You have a, a loose wrist approach where your wrist kind of is loose and it can bounce a little bit. And you have a fixed wrist approach. And we just talk briefly about the some of the physiological movements that we want to think about. You have when our wrist moves in towards the inside of our forearm we can call that wrist flexion wrist flexion when it moves the wrist moves the hand to the outside of the forearm that's that's wrist extension so and when we're in the middle we're kind of in the mid-range so when we have a loose wrist it's kind of towards the mid-range um it could hang if you're relaxed um but basically you have these two ranges of the um wrist now i like to use a more loose wrist approach um, when I'm playing chords that repeated chords that aren't very fast so maybe um, think of something maybe like Via Lobos prelude number one for the most part you can just kind of let your your list your wrist bounce bounce a loose wrist approach and um, you, you know you're not gonna get I don't find that I get tired that way letting the wrist bounce and but as chords 
start to go faster when you have fast repeated chords like you do often in the the danza here um i find it's good to do more of a fix a fixed wrist approach and what you do is you're actually you keep this fixed not necessarily tight but more static the wrist stays straight and you move more from a rotation up here and um from your arm i kind of think of it as having a like if your hand is a a crane um and then you've got the the apparatus holding the crane that's your arm so the movement comes more from the arm and it, it's something be something like this like uh so i'm actually moving more i feel my whole arm doing it and you can do that i find i can do that a long time if i you know and not tire out because i'm using these um the larger limbs rather than relying on on my wrist and my hands as much so um that the, the arm brings me to the strings so that's just a tip that i find that helps you also have it here in the um a lot in the piece you have it in this this section and so on so um again it's just a tip that i think helps to make the the piece more enjoyable to play musically and, and hope, hopefully more expressive thank you so much for joining me here on this uh, virtual guitar series at hillsborough community college in tampa and thanks again to mark switzer and kathy pantelis for inviting me to be part of the series uh it's always an honor to to be invited to um to uh play for you and um I uh, hope you enjoyed this. I hope this uh, was helpful to to all of you watching. Um, just some tips on one of my favorite composers for the guitar. We're very lucky to have this this great um, this great really guitarist composer, uh, one of the great guitarist um, composers of the for the classical guitar of the uh, 20th and 21st centuries, and um, right up there with you know in the same. Uh, to me he's right up there with Barrios or Antonio Laro, um, someone who knew the guitar really intimately and, uh, and, and, and composed for it with a, with a passion. And, and I encourage you, if you haven't, to look into some of his, his other compositions. He has a huge catalog of music uh, besides this piece. This is a good introduction um, to his music. That he really does have a, a, a wide range of music for the classical guitar. So thanks. Be well.